Welcome to The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Listen to Joe tackle the really tough moral issues, current events, and politics from a Catholic perspective. Now here's Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. My pastor and I had an interesting conversation the other day. Like me, he's a man who sees the glass of water as half full. So when he takes a position a little more negative than mine, I pay attention. In fact, I usually cogitate on what he says. Father is young enough to be my son, but he's a very holy priest and wise beyond his years. Come to think of it, he's wise beyond my years. What we were talking about was the average person's belief in God. It was my contention that Catholics are generally lukewarm because they don't so much have a belief in God as they have a concept of God. In other words, they don't see him as a real being, but rather as a concept. Father, on the other hand, made it more simple and to the point. He said people just don't care. Hmm, that's much worse than my opinion, and I have a tendency to think Father's probably right because he has to deal with people on a whole different level from what I do. That gives him a much clearer perspective than I can possibly have. Regardless of what father I think, the idea of apathy, not caring, or disbelief obviously doesn't apply to you, or you wouldn't be listening to this in the first place. However, we all know people, even practicing Catholics, who are lukewarm. Do they disbelieve? Do they not care? Do they merely see God as a concept? We could probably ask for opinions about this from 100 people and get 100 differing opinions. Regardless of the reason for the malaise and lukewarmness among Catholics, it's a serious problem that Jesus talked about in Revelation 3.15. He said, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. In my opinion, what this tells us is that we need to quit being lukewarm, and that means we need to renew our commitment to God. But if people only see him as a mere concept or don't believe in him at all, well, you can't be committed to a concept or to someone you don't believe in. This means we need to prove God exists so we can help our Catholic families and friends. So we'll prove the existence of God right after this. Learn things about the Catholic faith you never knew in Joe Sixpack's Secrets of the Catholic Faith. There are many essentials to our holy and ancient faith that few modern Catholics know. Those essentials have become, well, secrets, hence the title Secrets of the Catholic Faith. Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, is always exciting, never boring, and completely politically incorrect. He never shies away from the so-called untouchable moral issues. With his use of humor and directness, readers and students can never get enough of what he teaches. According to Joe, there isn't one single teaching of the Catholic Church that can't be completely demonstrated to an inquiring mind. Everything can be demonstrated. But the Catholic laity aren't being taught these things. They're being fed pablum when they need and want meat. Secrets of the Catholic Faith is actually exciting, and it will make any Catholic's chest swell with pride. So get your copy of Secrets of the Catholic Faith by Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy, today in print or ebook on Amazon, Apple Books, Barnes and Noble, and Kobo. For 50 years, secondary and post-secondary schools, both public and private, have been teaching evolution as a fact rather than a theory. The end result of this has been a belief that God doesn't exist. This is an unfortunate reality in most of our Catholic colleges and universities and some of our Catholic high schools. For some illogical reason, the theory of evolution takes for granted that God doesn't exist, and adherents to evolution say you can't prove God exists. Poppycock. You can prove God exists. I know of six proofs for the existence of God, but all of them require the use of something modern students aren't taught anything about, logic and reason. For the last 50 years, students have been taught that knowledge of the truth is arrived at through emotion. In other words, a thing is true because you feel it's true. So someone could say, I believe the sky is purple, and it'd be purple for that person. 
but all truth is really arrived at through logic and reason. People tell me that you can't prove the existence of God because there's no empirical evidence. The problem with that rather arrogant false claim is empirical evidence is just that, evidence. Evidence merely supports the existence of a truth, but evidence isn't the proof itself. In science, every scientific truth began with a theory. After the theory is formulated, the search begins for the evidence to support the theory in an effort to prove it's true. For example, DNA began as a theory. Scientists knew for years that DNA existed because of evidence they'd uncovered through the use of logic and reason, but it took them years before they were able to come up with the empirical evidence. Still, even without empirical evidence, they knew of the existence of DNA. The same holds true for proving the existence of God. We don't have any empirical evidence that he exists, but there's plenty of other evidence to say that he does. And that's what I'm going to show you here by using logic and reason. There are other arguments that are more convincing for the existence of God, but the argument I'm going to present seems to always work best with the average everyday person. Besides, it's really kind of fun. I call it the bad man, madman argument, and I've been using it in my evangelization for 30 years. The reason I chose this argument for God's existence is so you can have a simple explanation to explain how we know God exists when talking with your lukewarm Catholic family members and friends. Before I begin the argument, I've got to admit to being a bit prideful about this. I began using this argument decades ago, believing I'd developed something new. Well, with a 2,000-year-old church, it's probably not possible to come up with anything new. A few years after I began using this argument, I discovered that an obscure saint from the 3rd or 4th century was using it way back then. It was a bit of an ego deflator for me. Let's begin the argument. To present this argument, I'll have to ask you to stipulate a couple of things for the sake of brevity. The first thing I need you to stipulate is that the Old Testament is ancient Hebrew literature. I'm not claiming it's inspired, I'm not claiming it's infallibly true, or anything else, only that it's ancient Hebrew literature. The second stipulation I'm asking from you is that Jesus of Nazareth was a true historical person. I'm not saying he's the Messiah, God, the Son of God, or anything else, only that he was a real historical person. Now you might say, gotta stop you, you don't have anything to back that claim up other than the Bible. Well, that's not so. That Jesus was a real historical person is attested to by the writings of men who were contemporaries of Jesus. Specifically, I'm talking about Pliny, Tacitus, Suetonius, and Flavius Josephus. The first three men were pagans and certainly no friends of Jesus. Flavius Josephus was like Paul. He was both a Jew and a Roman citizen, and he was most assuredly not at all sympathetic to Jesus. Historical scholars tell us that the writings of these four men validate the four Gospels, making them historically reliable. So we not only have the testimony of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but we also have the writings of Pliny, Tacitus, Suetonius, and Flavius Josephus. So with these two stipulations made, we can now present our argument. First, we'll consider the Old Testament prophecies of the coming Messiah. The Old Testament is filled with such prophecies, particularly in the books of Jeremiah, Isaiah, and the Psalms, and there's even the very first promise of a Messiah in the early part of Genesis. We're still not claiming these prophecies are true, but rather that they're in the Old Testament. Now, if we were to take all of the Messianic prophecies of the Old Testament and list them in a column, then read all the accounts of the life of Jesus, we'd find that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies perfectly. But does this prove that Jesus was the Messiah? Well, no, as a matter of fact, it doesn't. Applying logic and reason, we can deduce that Jesus of Nazareth could only have been one of three types of persons, a bad man, a madman, or who he says he is. Could Jesus have been a bad man? Could a bad man, a criminal, wake up one day and decide that he'd fulfill all the messianic prophecies? He might reason that he could convince the people that he was the Messiah by fulfilling the prophecies and that he'd be hailed as their king. 
He could raise an army to rout out the Romans from Israel, become a very wealthy and powerful man, and have lots of women and material wealth and so on. Could a bad man do that? Well, sure he could, but this reasoning breaks down with one prophecy. One of the prophecies says the Messiah would have to die. Now, would a criminal work so hard to fulfill the prophecies if he knew he'd have to die? I know I wouldn't. One hallmark of a criminal is that they're selfish and think of themselves before they think of anyone else. So Jesus couldn't have been a criminal. Not a chance. Could Jesus have been a madman? Could a madman wake up one day and say, What's that, God? You say I'm the Messiah and I need to start fulfilling prophecy? Well, okay, God. Would or could a madman do that? Again, that's certainly a possibility, especially with a smart lunatic. But reason and experience with the insane tells us this won't work. Why? Consistency. A madman can't remain consistent long enough to pull this off. A 20th century example of this is Adolf Hitler. We entered the Second World War in 1941 with Germany declaring war against the United States on December 11, 1941. But it was almost three years before we had a significant victory over Germany. Our European enemy had the greatest military and most brilliant war generals the world had ever known, but we defeated them anyway. The reason was Hitler's insanity. As long as Hitler listened to his war generals, the Germans won. It was only when Hitler's insanity kicked in and he began listening to his astrologers instead of his generals that we were able to begin to turn the tide of the war to our favor. That's the nature of insanity. But Jesus was far from insane. The science of psychology only began in 1879, making it a mere 140 years old. Psychologists agree that if Jesus was nothing else, he was both sane and consistent. While they may not agree with what he taught, or at least the various interpretations of what he taught, they certainly agree that he was sane. Therefore, Jesus couldn't have been a madman. If Jesus couldn't have been a bad man, and if he couldn't have been a madman, then he must have been who he said he was. And who did he say he was? He said he was God. Jesus repeatedly claimed to be God throughout the New Testament, but my personal favorite is found in John 8, 58. Here's what took place. The Jews said to him, Are we not right in saying you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I have not a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is only one who seeks it, and he will be the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died, and the prophets who died? Who do you claim to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is for nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say that he is your God, but you have not known him. I know him. If I said I do not know him, I should be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he was to see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Jews then said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Now, Jesus' comment saying, I am, seems pretty innocuous to most of us, and maybe doesn't even make sense to many of us, but it was enough to make the Jews want to kill him. Why? To get the answer to that, we have to go back to the third chapter of Exodus. It's here that God just gave Moses his marching orders to go to the children of Israel as his messenger and their liberator. Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am, the statement of the All-Eternal. Every Hebrew male in those days was obliged to memorize the entire Pentateuch, or first five books of the Old Testament. So the Jews understood by Jesus' statement exactly who he was claiming to be. 
He was claiming to be God, so they sought his death for blasphemy. So if Jesus couldn't have been a bad man, and he couldn't have been a madman, and he had to be who he said he was, and he said he is God, then we must conclude by logic and reason that God exists. That's the argument that most people find to be satisfying to the intellect. However, if some people might need a little more, you can always give a brief presentation of the argument from design and the argument from conscience. Let's try the argument from design first. We can see from nature that it could only exist through the design of a supreme architect. Trees inhale carbon dioxide and exhale oxygen. We inhale oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. We can't exist without the trees, and they can't exist without us. What logic! The food chain teaches us a bit about God's existence. The teeniest, tiniest, microscopic organism is food for the next largest organism. And that's food for the next largest organism. And that's food for the next largest organism. And on it goes until it reaches the top of the food chain, us humans. We eat, digest the food, our bodies evacuate the waste, then the process starts all over again, with the tiniest organism feeding on the waste. Again, what logic? You might say, are you crazy? That stuff is all from evolution. Everybody knows about the fact of evolution. It's science, man. Whoa, I'm not the one who's crazy. First, evolution isn't a fact, it's a theory. Second, it's a false theory because it actually violates the very science being touted here. Evolution contends that order accidentally came from chaos and became the world in nature as we know it, that the chaos gradually became better and more ordered. But the third law of thermodynamics tells us the universe is entropy, that all matter is in a constant state of deterioration from order to chaos. If all matter is in a constant state of deterioration, how in the world could chaos evolve into order? You can't have it both ways. Either evolution is right, and it's a theory, or thermodynamics is right, which is a proven fact, which is why it's called a law. The next short argument is the argument from conscience. We intuitively know the difference between right and wrong. This is called natural law. It's something that used to be taught in every law school, but the political left managed to banish natural law from our scholarly institutions. The reason the political left banished it is because they fear it. It doesn't comport to their agenda. It's been this way since the Supreme Court rulings in 1973 on Roe v. Wade and Bolton v. Doe cases. Since abortion is the unjust taking of a human life, it doesn't conform to natural law. We intuitively know it's wrong to unjustly take an innocent human life, wrong to disobey legitimate authority, wrong to treat another person unjustly, wrong to steal, wrong to lie, etc. We know all these things intuitively. Again, that's natural law. And we can learn natural law just by observing the world around us. The fact that we have natural law implies a lawgiver. Who else could that lawgiver be but God? You might say, wait a minute, the conscience is formed from religious teaching in union with the human brain. What? The thing that debunks your argument that conscience comes from religious teaching in the brain are the sciences of social anthropology and medicine. First, there isn't a neurologist in the world who can tell us what part of the brain the conscience comes from, because the conscience isn't a function of the brain, it's a function of the soul. And second, anthropologists have discovered tribal communities in remote locations of the world that already had a moral code in place when they discovered them, and that moral code comports to natural law, a moral code without the influence of Judeo-Christian religions. So how does your objection hold up to that? I know nobody wakes up in the morning with a burning desire to prove that God exists, but it's something we need to be able to do today if we're to help our families, friends, and society return to some semblance of sanity. Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, is a welcome visitor to parishes across the United States every Sunday through his What We Believe, Why We Believe It bulletin inserts. Using humor, immutable truth, and ignoring political correctness, Joe Sixpack helps the average Catholic in the pew better know and understand our holy and ancient faith in a way that is refreshing, awe-inspiring, and makes readers chest-pounding proud to be Catholic. And readers love it. 
Now you can enjoy Joe's work by getting the best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It book series. In fact, get two copies of each book, one for yourself and one for your pastor. Then your priest can decide if he wants to help your fellow parishioners by subscribing to the What We Believe, Why We Believe It bulletin inserts. Get your copy of The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It by Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy, today in print or ebook on Amazon, Apple Books, Barnes and Noble, and Kobo. Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy, wants to make sure you're informed about all the Catholic news you need to know. Here's Joe Sixpack's top five Catholic news picks for this episode. Catholic news pick number five. Hats off to LifeSite News. A federal judge issued a nationwide injunction Thursday against the Trump administration's rule that threatens to cut a tenth of Planned Parenthood's federal tax funding by disqualifying abortion groups from family planning funds. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick pick number four. Hats off to LifeSite News. The Kansas Supreme Court upheld a lower court ruling against a ban on dismemberment abortion today, arguing that a right to abortion exists in the state's constitution. According to National Public Radio, the landmark ruling now stands as the law of the land in Kansas with no path for an appeal. Because it turns on the state's constitution, abortion would remain legal in Kansas even if the Roe v. Wade case that established a national right to abortion is reversed by the United States Supreme Court. Believe it or not, six of the seven book-reading moron justices found a right to unfettered abortion in the phrase, pursuit of happiness. You can read the whole story by clicking on the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News Pick pick number three. three. Hats off to the blaze. Pope Francis has donated a half million dollars to assist migrants stranded at the United States-Mexico border and throughout Mexico, the Vatican announced Saturday. The Vatican said funds will be distributed between 27 projects among 16 Mexican dioceses and congregations, all of which requested assistance to continue providing migrants with basic necessities like food, water, and shelter. Peter's Pence, which issued the funds, said additional funds are necessary because media attention surrounding the crisis has decreased, resulting in a decrease of humanitarian aid. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick pick number two. two. Hats off to LifeSite News. Prominent clergy and scholars, including Father Aidan Nichols, one of the best-known theologians in the English-speaking world, have issued an open letter accusing Pope Francis of committing heresy. They ask the bishops of the Catholic Church to whom the open letter is addressed to, quote, take the steps necessary to deal with the grave situation, end quote, of a pope committing this crime. The authors base their charge of heresy on the manifold manifestations of Pope Francis' embrace of positions contrary to the faith and his dubious support of prelates who in their lives have shown themselves to have a clear disrespect for the Church's faith and morals. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick pick number one. Hats off to LifeSite News. Three dioceses of Buffalo priests have been suspended from ministry following reports from seminarians that the priests took part in vulgar, pornographic conversations at a party at a parish rectory earlier this month. Two other priests have also been disciplined for not doing enough to stop the inappropriate conversation. Vile and graphic language, crude humor, disparaging comments about others, and tales of sexual activity of a parishioner, one of the seminarian's parents, and seminary priests, including how one priest had likened a sex act to receiving communion, were all part of the seminarian's complaints over the April 11 party with seminarians and priests at the St. Peter and Paul Parish Rectory in Hamburg, New York. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. 
I believe a really great way to teach the faith is through stories, parables, and anecdotes. So here's today's story. A few years after World War I, the Prince of Wales visited a hospital for hopelessly wounded veterans. Beside each broken body, he stopped, shook hands, and spoke a word of encouragement. As he was led to the doorway, the prince said, I understood you had 36 patients here, but I've only seen 29. The nurse explained that the others were too horribly maimed for him to see. Is it for my sake or theirs that you're not taking me there? asked the prince. For yours, sir. Then I insist you show me in. Here, too, he stopped and thanked each wounded soldier for his sacrifice. Again, he turned to his guide. Where's the seventh? I've seen only six. Again, the nurse objected. Please don't ask to see him, sir. I want to see him. I must see him. I advise against it, your highness. It can't do any good. I insist you take me in, demanded the royal visitor. The prince followed the nurse into a darkened room to what was left of a human body, blind, twisted, hideously broken, and disfigured. The prince turned white, his lips were drawn, and tears trickled down his cheeks. He bent down and kissed the cheeks of the broken hero. There was another prince who came down from his palace in heaven, not only to visit and shake hands with those wounded in the war with sin, but to raise them up, body and soul. Jesus heals broken souls in the sacrament of penance. The power to forgive sins is a power he gave to the apostles and their successors, the bishops and priests of the Catholic Church. He instituted the sacrament of penance on the evening of the first Easter, when he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. When G.K. Chesterton, one of the best-known and most brilliant converts of the 20th century, was asked why he became a Catholic, he answered bluntly, to get rid of my sins. How long has it been since you've been to confession? Hey, Six Packers, that's all for this episode. I've enjoyed having you with me. Don't forget to like me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter. The links are in my show notes. Also, remember to visit joesixpackanswers.com to sign up for my free email course. Each short lesson arrives in your inbox every three days. We also have the Cantankerous Catholic Social Media Group you can join to discuss anything about Catholicism, our country, or anything else on your mind. I visit the page every day. The link's also in my show notes. There are lots of other neat things of interest in my show notes, too. You can find them at cantankerouscatholic.com. And remember to live by the Joe Sixpack battle cry. Comfort and conviction don't live on the same block. This has been the Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Thanks for subscribing, and be sure to visit cantankerouscatholic.com to get your free copy of Joe's popular book, The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It.